If you and your annoying co-workers found yourselves hunted by masked hypocrites using the guns you mass produce to seek revenge against you, what would you do? This team of miscreants has arrived in Eastern Europe to attend a totally optional, not at all mandatory, team building retreat for the arms manufacturer they work for. Unfortunately, they get stranded by an angry bus driver just inside the territory of an armed militia with a grudge against their company. If they want to make it out alive, they're going to have to work together to endure the mines, traps, and bullets of their assailants, as well as the awkward, creepy, sycophantic fumblings of their boss. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the masked militia in severance. A fat, strong American lumbers after two blondes in the forest. They look terrified, and doubly so when the ground suddenly collapses beneath them, trapping them in a deep pit. <laughs> Well, we know the American didn't dig that himself be because he's fat. Dude pauses just long enough at the top of the hole to hear the girls beg for help. Turns out they were all running from someone else. He apologizes and continues trucking. <laughs> Keep up those steps, big guy. You're doing great. Back in the pit, the girls crank this baby up to PG-13 as they strip trying to cobble together a ladder using their clothing and a stick. Turns out their jeans and crop top coats just didn't provide enough fabric. Uh, and they get pretty easy. Okay, like. I love this movie. But no, your elastic triple D bra isn't gonna help here, and you don't need it anyway. Use that stick to dig handholds out of the dirt this pit is made of and get out of there. Back with our American friend, he steps on a tripwire and gets hog snared. He's too winded to fight when an unseen assailant guts him with a hunting knife. <laughs> At least you don't have to jog anymore. We cut to a rented tour bus absolutely mad lighting it through the Eastern Europe countryside. It contains all the best office workers for the world's leading arms dealer, Palisades Defense. They're from the London office, and already sick of watching a commercial from their budget Tony Stark overlord, George, played on repeat on the bus TV. This team was handpicked for their masterful archetypes. We have... Memo. Must congrat George on terrific performance. Richard, the brown nosing manager. We are getting high. We have offices in New York. Billy, Richard's two for executive assistant. Ah, it's so oh. Steve, the resident idiot, who's ordering himself a Balkan beauty with his impeccable mountain bus Wi Fi, smoking in the bathroom, and getting lit up on Mario's. Go on, Gail. Go on. The hot co worker, Maggie, who's pretending to work. Or even worse, actually working. I'm a little less talking. I'm the only one who cares about our marketing strategy. I can't. Gordon, the brown noser's brown noser. Be more excited. Why are all the actors here white? Jill, the resident social justice warrior. It's not funny, huh? <laughs> And Harris, the character who definitely quiet quit six months ago. Apparently, they're on a crusade to spread the gospel of the AR-15 to Eastern Europe. Which, as we'll see in a bit, kinda backfires. Suddenly, the driver brings the bus to a screeching halt. There's a downed tree in the road. Richard commands the driver to take an alternate route down what looks like a dirt road. We can go this way. How about no? You're in the vehicle equivalent of a train car with stripped suspension. It can barely do this road well. Even the driver's immediate answer is no. He's heard bad things about that route. Richard tries to put his foot down, but all that does is inspire the driver to unload all their stuff and leave them in the middle of BFE nowhere. This dude has zero chill. We all know none of these people speak his language, but he doesn't even try to tell them why the route they want to take is dangerous. Maybe telling him several other busloads of people have gone missing would help change Richard's mind. Or how about you use the road that will not be named to turn the bus around and go back down the mountain to an alternate route, if this is such a problem for you. Look, I try not to dabble in stereotypes, but maybe you should have gone for the bribe instead of relying on Richard's level one charisma to see us through this. Billy tries to convince Richard that the distance to the lodge they're trying to reach is way farther than it appears on a map. An inch is usually a mile, isn't it? 
No. You telling me I don't know how to read maps? N no. Uh, yes. I do believe that is exactly what he's telling you. We've all had a terrible boss like Richard, and we've all wanted to abandon them in the woods. Now's your chance, Billy. Run. And the bus driver leaves them there. I don't want to make blanket statements about other countries, but I feel like most places frown upon abandoning tourists in the woods. Not a good look on TripAdvisor. Now alone, they hear a strange sound coming from the forest. Maybe Winnie the Pooh's on holiday for murdering teens in the Hundred Acre Wood. There are no bears in Hungary. If we cross the border into Romania, then there are bears. Bears required to stop at borders? Not when they're packing what Palisade's defense is selling, which is more than I can say for these co-workers. Despite working for one of the world's largest arms dealers, none of them brought weapons of any kind. Not even a sharp pencil. Richard directs them all to follow him down the dirt road. But Maggie's quick to say they should stick to the road that they were already on. No, 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 this way is much quicker. You all know he's a moron, and you all punched your time card the second he got you kicked off that bus. Just remind him you're on paid overtime, and he'll be begging to leave you behind. At which point, you can do the correct thing of hopping over that tree in the road and continuing to your final destination along the bus route. Instead, they follow him like rats behind the Pied Piper, to their obvious doom. Even if they don't run into a bear or crazed killer who likes to chase a couple of ladies through the woods, they're gonna get super lost. Steve immediately shrews his way off the beaten path to take a leak, forcing half the team to go in and find him. He tells them there's a masked guy in the woods, but they assume it's the Skittles, and poor Billy is assigned to be his keeper. Billy, not paid nearly enough. And Steve's too zonked out to notice, he's given a corpse a shower. Back on the trail, Maggie ties Steve to a leash, which is the most sensible thing anyone on this team has done yet. And a few minutes later, they arrive to the condemned house they mistake as the lodge where they're supposed to meet their boss. Steve reminds everyone there's someone in the woods before they shove open an old rusted fence and waltz right in. <laughs> If my boss brought me here, I'd assume we're fighting to the death for the last corner office, or getting liquidated. Richard refuses to believe this isn't the right location for their team building weekend, even when Jill points out the invitation letter specified luxury lodge accommodation, which this definitely isn't. Meanwhile, nobody notices Steve hallucinating in the corner. Harris and Gordon split up to find the generator. Gordon enters his suspense generator phase, while Harris uncovers weird case files in the basement by nightfall. The entire team has moved off to their respective corners of the building when Richard is awoken to the sounds rattling through the house. Alright, I just realized what's scarier than a maniac with a knife. A guy in middle management with a knife. Turns out, it's all a nightmare. But, uh... <laughs> I rest my case. Give me a normal killer any day. In the kitchen, Bobby pours over the documents Harris found in the basement, local asylum records, with odd connections to their company Palisade's defense. Dinner comes with a silent movie. Harris tells them that before the First World War, strange reports by the locals about the asylum in the woods forced authorities to investigate. But when the investigator arrived, he realized too late that the patients had taken over the asylum and locked up all the doctors. They killed the investigator forcing the locals to turn to Palisade defense to neutralize the threat. The asylum was bombed with nerve gas until everyone was dead. Save a single patient who swore revenge against any Palisade employee that dared enter the land again. Jill corrects him. His story is partially true, but only partially. Facilities like these were used after the fall of the Soviet Union in the 90s to try and rehabilitate war criminals, most of whom were eventually put down by Palisade's weapons. She says they don't want revenge, only to survive. <laughs> yeah, right. Story time ends when Steve bites down on what turns out to be a human tooth with gold fillings. Everyone turns on Gordon, who explains he found a pie and cooked it thinking it was a welcome gift. From whom? Sweeney Todd? It should be abundantly clear that this is not the luxury accommodation that they were supposed to be at, meaning they're in someone else's home. And I doubt the same homeowners that make a pie with teeth in it are going to be fond of you squatting in their dump. 
However, it is a bit late to go hiking through the woods trying to find the real place. In the middle of the night, Jill uses the bathroom and realizes why bathroom curtains are a thing. The others come running. Fortunately, only Richard is dumb enough not to believe she saw something. Billy, Harris, and Steve venture outside to check and discover platforms connecting the trees overhead. Looks like hunting stands, but why so close to a house? And why are they all connected? Hmm, too early to say why, but screw this place. Come morning, I'm going home. For now, we need to survive the night, which means not going outside in your PJs. And if you do, maybe you wanna grab a knife or something before going outside to check on a masked man. You're in your PJs, unarmed with a dollar store flashlight. If you can see him, it's because he wants you to, and you're about to die. Plus, you just left the door to the lodge wide open for anyone to sneak in and hide until they can slit your throat in your sleep. Sweet dreams. Back inside, Jill says she's leaving. Harris says they'll wait till morning, then climb up the nearest hill for a signal to call for a car. Richard warns them that if anyone leaves, they won't have a job when they return to London. But Jill doesn't care, and neither should she. The next morning, when she hasn't changed her mind, Richard takes credit for Harris's plan and and sends Harris and Jill to scale the mountain to call for an Uber. Meanwhile, the rest of them are going to do some team building by playing paintball. Paintballing is about teamwork, no Rambos. Why don't we play Monopoly while we're at it? Harris and Jill head off on their mission, downhill, might I point out, and stumble upon the ruins of their tour bus along the road, and their bus driver torn to shreds by a nearby pond. They jump in the bus and race for camp back in the woods. Paintball plays out pretty much how you'd imagine, until Gordon steps on a bear trap that skewers his left leg. <laughs> Would you look at that? The team building they needed after all. Maybe, and I'm just spitballing here, how about you find something to wedge into the bear trap to stop it from springing back on his leg? Better yet, work as a team to get him free. The bear trap has three sections. The jaws, which are wrapped around his leg, the pan, which which he stepped on, and the springs, which sent the jaws into his leg in the first place. To free him, they need to put pressure on the springs with their feet while Maggie balances him so he can remove pressure from the pan and lift when the springs are secure. No! <laughs> Instead, they fail so spectacularly, they amputate his leg. They realize the ground is littered with bear traps just as the bus speeds in out of nowhere. Maggie tells them they need to keep Gordon's severed leg cold and, well, not a bad idea. <laughs> Harris speeds the bus down the path, too fast to notice the spikes someone tosses across the road. The bus flips before coming to a grinding halt. Jill's the first to awake, with obvious head trauma. She's disoriented, numb, and confused. She clambers out of the broken back windshield and sees Harris has been ejected. She carries on into the woods, oblivious to the man with the machete who steps forward, and Mary Antoinette's him. Look, I get this whole bus crash thing might have been a bit disorienting. However, I also think my base instinct wouldn't be to wander off, separating myself from the rest of my group. Not that they're gonna be much help, but at least they could watch my back so I didn't get my head lopped off out of nowhere. Jill wanders a little farther until reality hits her like a Mike Tyson punch. <sighs> A little too late. In the bus, the others stumble out to deal with their assorted problems. They realize Harris is dead and Jill is missing, so Billy tries to make a plan. Jill! Oh, voice down! Someone's killed Harris! We head back to the lodge, we lock ourselves in till morning, then we walk. Yeah, that's pretty much their only option at this point. They help carry Gordon down the road, oblivious to Jill only a few feet off the trail, tied and gagged to a tree. The masked maniac douses her in gasoline, and when his matches won't catch, he uses a flamethrower on her. Not much that could be done here besides not wandering off by yourself. Man, it's really not looking good for Palisade defense. The others reach the lodge. Maggie wonders if the stories about this place are true, about insane war criminals targeting Palisade employees, but good little bootlicker Richard won't hear it. As we all know, arms companies have never done anything immoral in their whole lives. Billy rallies the troops to board up the house. With what? Check Gordon's bag. Well, he's not going to have ammo now, is he? How for f 
psych. Boarding up at least one floor of this building is a great temporary solution, considering the man outside isn't your run-of-the-mill mountain murderer. If the files are right, he's a war criminal trained in the art of combat, which means we need to outsmart him with limited resources and using the knowledge of his background to our advantage. We gotta pull down deep into our seven days to die gameplay knowledge and build a quick horde night setup. Board up all windows and doors, save two access points, find a spot where the floor creaks, or you can lay pieces of garbage down that make noise when moved down in front of one of the access points. Make it look appealing, but also challenging to get through. Leave the second access point seemingly unbooby trapped. What this should do is lure the killer into a false sense of superiority. He can look at the unguarded access points as bugs in our system, not the features they actually are. Then wait for him. Eventually, one or both entry points will turn into death funnels. Arm yourselves with wood, metal bar, anything heavy that can pack a punch and wait for him to attempt entry. When he does, well, you know what to do. Instead, they have to and Steve doses poor Gordon with a pilly. Gordon, take one of these, yeah? Oh God, it's hard to watch. X may cause temporary tension and pain relief, but it also causes a whole slew of physical issues that will kill a dude who just got his leg chopped off. Initially, it'll constrict his blood vessels, but when it wears off, his veins and arteries will dilate, sending a cascade of blood toward a wound that is probably not tightly tourniqueted enough. It can also cause low sodium, resulting in muscle cramps. Can you imagine having your leg chopped off and then getting a Charlie horse? No, thank you. Not to mention, dude, you have a dangling from your lips. Give him that instead. At least he won't be bouncing off the walls with his stump. Hours later, the true killers kick in. Boredom in tiny bladders. Billy tells everyone he's gotta go and breaks the seal on their super secure bunker to do it. silent assailant maxed out on stealth buffs creeps in behind them. Guys, uh, hey guys, you wanna? Never mind. Maggie suddenly says they need to leave Gordon behind to go for help. <sighs> I like her. I mean, let's be real. We were all thinking it. And he might already be dead. He's probably dead. So yeah, let's just go. Looks like the killer was one step ahead. At least we won't have to live with the guilt of that decision. Not that I would anyway. Super considerate of the killer to eliminate that problem. Unfortunately, Gordon screams from the basement, which means now we have to do something. Or do we? I guess we do. The others realize the door leading there has been unlocked. Without weapons or anything to defend themselves, they head down. If you're gonna go back for Gordon, can you please go back upstairs and grab literally anything? A blanket you could throw over his head to disorient him is better than nothing. Nearby, the asylum killer begins torturing Gordon. As the team ventures in deeper, they stumble upon a row of cells. A door bangs. Maggie and Billy approach the torture dungeon. Richard runs, and Steve lingers in the middle, waiting to see what he should do. I don't really blame any of them for their reactions. What I do blame them for is bringing Jack all with them. If even two of them had brought weapons, they could have outnumbered this guy before he could gain the upper hand. Billy opens the door. The killer turns, revealing he's carved the symbol for Palisade defense into Gordon's chest. Then suddenly, he blasted them with a shotgun, sending them all running. <laughs> This is why we don't go into murder dungeons unarmed. Not that it would matter considering he has a shotgun. Billy and Maggie hide, only to discover Billy's been shot in the chest. Richard waits for Steve to pass by without revealing himself, then bolts into the forest, leaving everyone else behind. He doesn't make it far though, stepping on a landmine along a dirt road. <laughs> Hard to see that coming. It is a landmine after all. That is what they were designed for. Hate to say it guys, but there's nothing that can or could have been done for this one. Sucks for you. The killer advances into the house and Steve hides in a wardrobe in Richard's room. Steve, hide better. Shut the 
door. He can see you. We can see you. Everyone can see you. This is like Margaret hiding under the truck and there's something wrong with the kids all over again. After the killer walks by, he notices Richard's cheese cutting knife. Finally, going for a weapon. If you count a cheese cutting knife as a weapon. Meanwhile, Maggie advances up the stairs with the killer's machete. The killer turns, coming for her. She prepares to strike. When the floor gives out, the killer aims his gun to kill her. And that's when Richard and his cheese knife spears him in the back. Okay, I will say that is a weapon. Maggie grabs the killer's gun and... Jesus! Well, that, that is the correct decision. Followed by a rookie move. Never assume the killer acted alone. I just gotta ask, where were all you guys when your buddy was getting his brains blown out? You have like eight guys. Why was Torture Man alone in the house by himself? You could have all barged in at once and had a field day in the torture dungeon. Instead, you let Mags get her hands on a shotgun. As one goes for his gun, Maggie fires again and destroys him. Unfortunately, the shot he only held two rounds. Suddenly out of ammo, they bluff to the edge of the house and run blindly into the forest. With no ammo left, there's no way they can fend off the war criminals. Their only option is to run, and even then, their odds are looking real bad. The armed men chase them deep into the woods. Maggie and Steve run and hide and run until they find Richard. The whole place is mine. I'm standing on one. It's one of Pal Assad's best-selling landmines, which means there's no way out except with the Grim Reaper. Richard helps them navigate the narrow minefield before drawing the armed guards to him like moths to a flame. It should be mentioned that literally every path or road they've encountered so far has been heavily booby-trapped, so they should be avoiding obvious paths or clearings at all costs. Maggie and Steve race ahead through the woods, recklessly, I might add, coming to a stop right outside the actual Palisades Lodge. We're back at the beginning of the movie. George was the fat, strong American, and the girls in the pit were Steve's friends. Maggie and Steve raid the kitchen for supplies. As back at the minefield, Richard finally blows himself sky high when he can take most of the killers with him. After he's gone, George cracks open the big gun. Where did they get a load of this? A military grade American t-shirt cannon. George steps outside to fire on the last remaining gunman in. <laughs> Whoops, does a uh, my bad cover it? Bro, you're the CEO of this defense company and you don't even know your own weapons. And of all the weapons you could have brought, you brought this. Not even a pistol? Pathetic. The entire gang takes off running, once again, without any weapons to defend themselves. Maggie runs into a hog snare, but Steve's ambushed before he can reach her. He tears off the guy's ear before finally jamming the machete into the dude's devil's alley. Unfortunately, Steve's immediately clobbered by the next guy. Maggie's cut down by her own would-be romantic partner, then beats him with a rock and finally... <laughs> Triple taps him with the biggest rock she can carry. Employee of the month right here. Steve regains his footing long enough to pick up one of their guns and waste one guy before the machete skewer tosses the world's smallest dagger at him. Maggie spots the flamethrower guy just as Steve settles down to do a little spontaneous surgery on himself. Ah! Steve, you idiot, you're letting all the juice out. With no way to locate Steve, Maggie finds a set of train tracks and sets off running. Meanwhile, Steve wakes from a sudden nap to see his friend's ladder has actually worked, just not in the way they thought it would. Maggie reaches a work camp overloaded with Palisade weapons before noticing a phone symbol on a nearby building. Maggie, spare five seconds to grab a gun. You know they work. What you know probably doesn't work is a phone out here. Oh, the uh, phone picks up on the first ring, and the operator even speaks English. Just long enough to put her on hold. She obviously can't wait, so she runs outside and finds the flamethrower guy waiting for her. She runs into a nearby building as he lets off a blast, climbing higher, looking for an escape, but ultimately becomes trapped. In a tight spot, the building looked 
promising, but without knowing the layout or that there aren't more men in there, it's only a blind maze for you to get lost in. When the flamethrower guy arrives to her floor, she leaps down to the ground, wrecking her ankle. She tries to crawl away as he emerges from the building and is forced to toss the empty flamethrower aside. He bears down on her with an axe, right as a hail of gunfire rings out. The machine gun wielding dancer saves the day with a surprisingly accurate mag dump, and Maggie and Steve embrace, alive and now heavily armed. Together, the four find a boat and row away into the sunset. All of this could have been avoided by simply letting the driver go back down and around the mountain, sticking to the main road once he abandoned us. If we had heeded warnings of a masked man outside more closely, we could have left earlier and possibly avoided some of this. But once trapped in the house at nightfall, it it was a miracle any of them made it out alive. For those reasons, I think Severance was, uh, kind of beaten, maybe. And remember, listen to your tour guide's warnings.